welcome you. I am Mark Hughes. I'm with the Racial Justice Alliance. I want to welcome you. Welcome all of you. We're going to go ahead and get started. We were, start, we were due to start off at four. We were waiting around for a little bit, trying to get some other folks to show up, but that's okay. We're going to, my mother used to say, I'll go if I'm going to have to go by myself. So let's go. Here's, here's what we're going to do is, is uh, we got a few things happening this afternoon. Uh, just to make everybody aware in the park, uh, I want to let you know what this is. This is... This is the bust the, the filibuster rally, the bust the filibuster rally. Uh, we came uh, to call out, uh, calling out to our elected folks, namely our, our senators. We're calling out to our senators, uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Hey, uh, what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to speak up on this situation. We'd like you to say something about what's going on here. Now, you probably know, some of you probably received some of these emails. Um, I'm going to just run, run a few numbers by you. Uh, before I do that, uh, I'll just uh, tell you what you can expect. Um, at, the, at the end of this, uh, I want to let you know that we're actually going to open the mic up to the community. Uh, there's going to be some, uh, some folks, with, there's a lot of folks with talent that come through this park all of the time. Some of them are going to be showing up. So if you're still here, like after 530, uh, hang out, you know, cheer on these folks that are, that are coming with all of this talent in the park. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, we're here uh, to call out Bernie Sanders and call out Patrick Leahy to say, hey, y'all, uh, we need to do something about this situation. So, so here's what's going on. You see, never in our lives have we faced such an, a, an existential threat to our democracy. Uh, what we're looking at here is, is, for those of you who recall, on Tuesday, uh, how many people were watching on Tuesday and you saw S1 go before the United States Senate? How many people know what S1 is? Okay, I see some hands out there. I see some hands. So, so that, that S1, that is the most important voting rights bill since 1965. Many of us know that the Voting Rights uh, Act was gutted in 2013 and we've never been the same uh, since. But, but listen to this. Um, in the wake of the Supreme Court uh, gutting the, 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 the Voting Rights Act of 1965, eight years ago, 28 bills, 28 bills with restrictive voting provisions have been enacted in 17 states uh, since, just since the beginning of this year. At least 61 bills, 61 bills with restrictive uh, voting provisions in 18 states are actively moving through legislatures and there are 31 of those that have already passed one chamber. So I don't know about you, but I think that's bad news. How many people think that's bad news? That's what I'm talking about. So overall, lawmakers have introduced at least 389 restrictive bills in 48 states. And just because Vermont and Maine are one of the two, are the two states that haven't, it doesn't mean that we don't have an active role in calling out to our legislators and letting them know that we care about this situation. All these bills suppress the votes of folks who are black and brown, folks who are children, folks with disabilities, uh, communities uh, uh, who are women and so forth. Uh, all, of the, all of these bills are in, being introduced. Every single one of these bills are being introduced under one common theme, a big lie. So only S1 has the ability to roll back the racist and the oppressive voting laws. Uh, the For, For the People Act had a majority vote present in the Senate, but it was blocked. It was blocked by this antiquated racist Jim Crow rule called the filibuster. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about this racist, antiquated, Jim Crow backwards rule that allows somehow or another the minority to, to set the agenda and to set the tone in our legislature, and that is not acceptable. The filibuster also threatens any hope for the implementation of any of the progressive policies that the vast majority of voters over, overwhelmingly are calling for. Any chance of seeing substantial gun control, immigration reform, climate policy, racial, environmental justice, and more. What's going on right now is just insanity. The elimination of the filibuster is the only way to neutralize the assault on our democracy. So what we came over here to tell you tonight is, is that we are gonna call on our legislators. You might ask, you might ask, you might say, hey, well, what can we do about it in this little state in Vermont? 
And what I mean, what I came to tell you is, is we have two of the most powerful, collectively, they're probably the most powerful two voices in the United States Senate. Somebody say hey. Hey! We have two of the most powerful voices in the United States Senate. The senior senator and the president pro temp, as well as the chair of the of the Appropriations Committee is our own, our very own Patrick Leahy. We also know that Bernie Sanders, two-time presidential candidate, as well as the bedrock, he is the bedrock of the Progressive Party, the United States Progressive Party. We know he's also the chair of the Budget Committee. So let me get this right. We got, we've got the chair of the Budget Committee, and we've got the chair uh, of the Appropriations Committee. So how on earth is it that collectively their voices are not calling out, are not crying out to their 98 constituents across the legislature saying, get rid of this filibuster. Get rid of this filibuster. You say it. Get rid of this filibuster. Get rid of this filibuster. So what we came to do is, is we wanted to, we came to call them into accountability. We came to ask uh, Bernie and to ask Patrick to speak out, to speak out publicly and to speak out loudly, uh, to, to call upon their folks, to, to, to call upon their folks not only to, to, um, to remove this uh, harmful uh, rule, but also, watch this, to call upon them to stay in Washington, D.C. until it's done. No summer break. You ain't coming home. When it's all said and done, you can come home. But stay in D.C. until we get this filibuster done. That's what we came to call them out to do. Yeah. Now, despite all the many moderate senators uh, refusing uh, publicly to, to demand this filibuster, we believe that the collective power of these two senators is the key to getting this done. How many people believe that? How many people believe that? Some, make, somebody make some noise. I know there's a few of us, but somebody, if you believe that, can you please put your hands together? So he, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're we're going to have a few speakers come up. Uh, just probably about five or six speakers will come up. You'll hear from, from them this, this afternoon on this particular topic. I'll have some more details from you. I do have an update because I have a, a note directly from Senator Sanders that I'd like to share with you. I also have a comment from Senator Leahy that I'll share with you. To my knowledge, I don't believe any of them are going to be here. Uh, I, do, I do believe that there's a possibility that maybe one of Bernie's staffers might be here. So um, I'm going to put, uh, Tanya, I'm going to put you on notice right now just as you're headed up this way. Um, but uh, it's a little bit weird because I have a hard time saying Tanya's last name. I always, always want to say Vohoski or something like that. Is that close? That's right. Is it Vohoski? So this is our very own representative uh, from our Essex, uh, our, our freshman senator from Essex. Can you please give it up for my good friend, Representative Tanya Vohoski? Thank you everyone for coming out. What we know is that in order to move towards liberty and justice for all, we need bold systemic change. We need to expand voting access, not suppress the vote. We need to bold climate action grounded in environmental justice. We need universal health care. We need livable wages and paid family medical leave. And we know we have a long way to go and that the people cannot continue to wait. People are dying. They're having their voting rights blocked, losing their housing, and obstructionists like Senator McConnell abuse the filibuster to ensure that it never gets better. It is time to take away the tools that the Senate is using to block progress. This is not a new tool. The filibuster was used as an attempt to block the Civil Rights Act. It's changed over time, and it's become easier to use and easier to abuse, and it shows. This tool has been implemented far more than ever. In the last decade, it was used more than three times as much as in the decade prior. We need to fight to strengthen our democracy and not let voting rights continue to be eroded. In Vermont this year, we passed expansive voting access expansion in S-15, and we need to continue to fight for our democracy at the state and federal level. This moment is an important one. As we recover from a pandemic, and face the many injustices that it had revealed and exacerbated. We need our government to act. 
to make bold moves. We are in desperate need of change. Instead, we have the least productive Congress in history, with Senator McConnell sitting in front of his self-proclaimed graveyard of bills, using every tool at his disposal to block progress and hurt people. Enough is enough. It is a convenient excuse as well for never moving forward on the bold policy agendas that we know the people want, and it's time that this tool was no longer in their arsenal. No more can, is this a tool to even force debate or build strong support. With the end of the speaking filibuster, the Senate can simply move on to something easier and block any progress that the minority is not interested in. This is a tool meant to do nothing more than allow for obstructionists to block legislation, and it is wielded against legislation that would help the people. And the people cannot continue to wait for action. We must stand together and demand that we fight for progress. End the filibuster. We have so far to go before each and every person has their needs met and truly has liberty and justice. And it's time that we take every tool and excuse away from the ruling class to block progress. We call on our federal delegation to stand up for the people and end the filibuster and vocally demand that we move forward because the people cannot continue waiting. Yes. Give it up! Yes, our freshman, freshman, Tanya Vahovsky. Thank you so much, Representative Vahovsky, for coming up at the spur of the moment. I was on vacation uh, over the last several days, and on Tuesday, I just had enough and started writing. And I, I think, uh, you know, it was, I just want to just give a shout out to organizations like Rights and Democracy. Thank you so much for coming out. The Progressive Party! The Racial Justice Alliance is over there. Yes, give it up, give it up. So I wanna, um, before we move on, I, I, I just wanna um, just let you know we're gonna take a, just a quick break as folks are still arriving. My good friend, Rajni Eddins is here and uh, he's gonna come to us uh, with some spoken word right now. He's gonna come uh, to us with, uh, with some spoken word uh, just to uh, get folks kind of loosened up a little bit. So we we are um, so proud to have my good friend and brother, Rajni Eddins! Peace, can y'all hear me? All right, I want to share peace with you because I know this is about the freedom of all people. And the foundational freedom of, of black people is, is crucial to all people's freedom. Uh, this is a piece in that spirit. It's called Beautiful Sun-Kissed People. So let me hear you say it. Say, Beautiful Sun-Kissed People. Beautiful Come on, say it with some enthusiasm. Beautiful people. All right. Walking miracles, unfolding parables, ancient scrolls and ocean's throes. Love be a rose adorning your ears. This morning will not bring mourning, nor a thorn in tears. This forever moment is shorn of fears. Say, beautiful sun-kissed people. people. We are on the cusp of overthrowing overseers. Light years beyond hecklers and jeers. No more tanning our hides while Dr. Jekyll steers. This love is sheer, transparent and near. As dear as your closest relative here. Say, beautiful sun-kissed people. No conversation on us being equal, just entertaining the thought is evil. We weave full, fully woven, lost and found, traded and stolen, but look what the eye beholding. Say, beautiful sun-kissed people. Golden, black and free and ebony, mahogany and mocha bee, chocolate hogging dyes can't see, rivers running melanin, Shallow men be monitoring, but most high got it all intents and purposes and sovereign skin. Watches this here poem ascends, journeying and frolicking. Summer breeze is talking with the autumn wind, how winter just won't break our stride. Too much spring springing step for us to hide. Our victory is justified. Say beautiful sun-kissed people. Solar rise with older ties, our currency ain't tokenized. We close to those focused and wise, whose feet arise on open skies. We. White supremacy eulogizing, blessed ministry new horizon, 
and desperate attempts at euphemizing our brilliance with futile lies still will never neutralize. Too many youth been euthanized, fed sweet as prey to tooth decay, but truthfully our roof away has truth to say. Adorns the night, salutes the day, and beauty that the stars obey. Say beautiful sun kiss people. I relate to you so musically, and oh the joy it brings like Lift every voice and sing, till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song. Full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Let earth and heaven ring in sacred oath, cause after all we are betrothed to wondrous wonders of untold, great grand good fortune that broke the mold. Can't buy us off with moldy bread, we've more than crumbs inside our heads, and crust just will not satisfy, when banquets alone are ours divine. We walk in gourmet grandma made, deliciousness in every shade. Say sun-kissed people. Say beautiful, blessed, bountiful, sun-kissed people. All right. I praise a path that plants our flag squarely in earth of self-made basking. A glorious newfound approach that predators cannot encroach. That parasites and wayward folks at a mere glimpse will cough and choke. See, this radiance is brighter still than every sun that lights a hill. It calls from something deep within and pours from vocal cords and pen. Say, beautiful sun kiss people. I'm nourished just to see you. You furnish my living room with life abundant killing gloom. You water every plant I'll have and flourish my gardens green and vast. Sing lullabies to my inner child and soothe all fears of foul defile. You spray me with your sense of grace and lovingly embrace my face. Say I am you and we are race that founded every human trace. Say sun kiss people. I wake with your poems on my tongue. In my chest I hear your drum. From my lips I hear your hum. It gets me high and drunk as rum. On you I am forever spun. Your melanin I'll never shun. With you I am forever one. Has there been better? Never one. Say sun kiss people. I bequeath these O's to you. And your next of kin and children too. And their children's 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 view. Will yet still match your vibrant hue. You supernatural sorcery. To walk in temples gorgeously. Shaming cathedrals far and near. Make a white Christ pale in the mirror. Sun kiss children you are it. Don't let nobody tell you shit, unless they fertilize in soil, to grow a rose regal and royal, to don a rose upon a rose of red and black and green and gold. So poetically bestowed, it dignifies your inner throne. Sun-kissed children, marvelous, miraculous magnificence, outlandishly so unabashed, unapologetic sass, ultra-magnetic blackness, the right God on your epitaph. But well, that's blasphemy, surely, right? Because we know true gods never die. Sun-kissed children, you kiss my eyes with all that sunshine you applying. I say I am in love for truth, cause you are me and I am you. From head to toe and all between, I love these princes, kings, and queens. I even find you in my dreams, and when I wake, I vow to breathe and breathe to vow. With every vowel and consonant I can pronounce, announce to cosmos all your feats. Build castles for your sweet retreats. Goose feathered pillows, black satin sheets, a sacred lounge to rest your crown from all the wounds been crying out. Sun-kissed people have no doubt. You're all I am, what I'm about. Can't tell my story without your page. Hell, every chapter be erased. You sew my line so seamlessly. We vibe on higher frequency. So let's not love in secrecy. My sun-kissed people, we bees the key. Thank you, Raj Nieri! Rosie's gonna come back to us in a little while with something else. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just a couple of announcements. You probably noticed that I changed hats. Uh, yep, uh, so I just wanted to let you know that there's, there's some, some merch on, over here on this side. If you wanna rock a hat like me, 
uh, over, there's also some shirts like the one that Dan Fingus is wearing. He's facing, he's waving at you right now. So, yeah, look, just step over there and get, and I think they're charging for it, but if you, got, if you don't have any money, they'll probably just give it to you. So just go over and see them. Uh, same thing over at our table. Uh, that's our table. I'll tell you now, if you go over there, you got a shirt. Um, they're taking donations, but it, nobody leaves without a shirt. So get over there and get one and rock it. Um, just a couple of uh, updates for you is, is that um, I just want to uh, remind folks, uh, BIPOC folks, that there is a part three of Out of Darkness. Uh, part three of Out of Darkness is at the Creative uh, Democracy. That's 266 Pine Street there. Uh, in the soda plant building. That's going to be on Thursday, this upcoming Thursday. So don't forget about that. That is a dynamite, dynamite documentary. Uh, black and brown folks show up. Uh, also want to um, just give a shout out for First Friday. Every First Friday we're getting together. Black and brown folks, we're getting together. Uh, that's I believe that's going to be at 20 Allen Street, um, but they're teetering on a bowling trip, but we're going to we're gonna do something like that upcoming. Turning the curve on systemic racism. Let me tell you a little bit about turning the curve on systemic racism and uh, the byline there is building back a healthier Vermont. Building back a healthier Vermont, this turning the curve is really based on uh, what we learned in this last legislative session. Uh, and it's also um, informed by a joint resolution that was passed by the legislature declaring racism as a public health emergency. I don't know whether you knew about that or not, but yes, the legislature passed a joint resolution uh, declaring racism a public health emergency. So we will be uh, pursuing that across the state uh, with, a, with a series that we're calling Turning the Curve on Systemic Racism, Building Back a Healthier Vermont. Our first session will be July 8th. It will be July 8th, and I think that's gonna be at 20 Allen Street, stay tuned. We'll keep you updated on that. Enough about the commercials. What we're here to do is, is to let you know that this whole business about this filibuster is a farce. Somebody say farce. farce. Somebody say farce. farce. Somebody say farce again. Farce. I, yeah, I knew some smart Alex out there. So, so said farce, farce again. So here's what I came to tell you is, is that really, keeping the, the, keeping the Jim Crow filibuster in place, it only serves to divide and silence us making us less safe, robbing us of our opportunities. Yet some senators, they refuse to publicly demand the elimination of the filibuster. As, the, as greedy and wealthy, they continue to benefit at the exclusion of our voices, the voices of the majority. That's why we're here. Eliminating this rule will ensure that we all have a voice in this democracy. And we are all afforded safety and access to opportunity. That's rightfully ours. So never in our lives have we faced such an existential threat to our democracy. This is a national crisis, folks. This is a national crisis that we are in right now. We demand that our senators publicly and urgently call for the retirement of the filibuster. Now, somebody say now. Now. Somebody say now. Now. Somebody say now. Now. We demand that the Senate majority take a stand, return to Washington, D.C., and stay there until this unfair, racist, Jim Crow filibuster rule is eliminated. What do you think? So bust that filibuster. Somebody say, bust that filibuster. Bust that filibuster. We want justice. What do we want? What do we want? We want justice. <laughs> what do we want? Just, what do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. Gotcha. <laughs> I am so proud uh, to introduce to some of you and just remind you, some of the others of his existence, a dear friend, a brother, a brother in Christ uh, with me at New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church, uh, and someone who's been a friend of my family uh, since most of them were knee-high to Coke bottles. Um, without further ado, uh, Mr. Roy V. Hill II. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for that introduction. 
Wow. First, I give honor to God as I come before you. A thought that runs through my mind twofold. A, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Uh, today, uh, we're talking because it's about you. You and I are here standing for the best in this country, for the best in this human life. You and I are here talking about the power within you to reach out, to speak up, to make a difference. But we look at media, and media reminds us that right now, there is so much hate, so much wickedness, so much evil. And the pipeline for that comes out of, unfortunately, Washington. Some of the best minds who are there. And they've been sustained by talking heads with expensive haircuts silk ties, tailored suits, and turning each other against each other, talking to death that which is right, that talk is wrong. We can speak to those who we've sent to Washington and say, enough, you can stand and make a difference. That's what you are about as a team, as a member of this human family in this place called Vermont, in this place called America, in this place called planet Earth, where we are one, where we are one. That recognition carries the day. It'll carry the day for our children, for our community, for our country. You know, James, Q. Whitman is a professor at <clears throat> Yale University. And in his recent book, entitled Hitler's American Model, he talks about why Hitler chose America for his manifesto. Because he says that America and its government was founded on a document that institutionalized, that institutionalized racism by officially perpetrating slavery and setting the stage for a range of race-based legislation and policies and practices. We're talking about one of those policies. It's called filibuster. For many of you, you'll remember the 60s. And in remembering the 60s, you'll remember two prominent leaders of the filibuster, Richard Russell, Jr. And there's a building in Washington named after him. In fact, it is. His statue is there. And of course, Strong Thurman. They filibustered strongly against passage of civil rights legislation in this country. Together they filibusted for 60 days, spouting evil for 60 days in the 60s, spouting evil. My undergrad was at an institution in Alabama. Some of my classmates went to march, to stand up, to stand like you're standing. But they didn't come back because they were killed. Some of the names who are of people that didn't make Fox News, they didn't have a chance to stand and speak. But you are standing. You can speak for them. You stand on their shoulders because their work, in spite of the filibuster, that eventually, thanks to folks like Hubert Humphreys, et cetera, went astray in the 65 
64 laws were passed. They were done so because people spoke up. You can speak up, you must. Because if you don't, who will? If you don't, who will? There are people around the country, U.S. of A. There are people around the globe. What's her name? Malala? She stood up. And she was hurt. But she kept standing tall. Don't let her standing go in vain. Your children are coming and they're looking for role models in you. They're looking for role models, the adults in the community. And when they can't find them, if they can't hear them, they have nothing to stand for, so they fall. They fall for recreational drugs, too, and some of them don't get up. They fall for suicide, and some of them don't get up. But if you had stood up, spoken up, you would have heard, maybe they would not have fallen. You are here. You can make a difference. Speak up. One person's voice can make all the difference in a way that you, in a way an I, are yet to realize. But that pebble that you throw in the water, Lake Champlain, starts a ripple that goes on and on and on. We are that ripple. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Lord, make us here this day, here in this state. Make us an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, let us, this place, this state, show love. Let's get rid of that filibuster. Amen. Roy Hill, I've got a couple things to read to you. So, um, one is a, um, it's a, a letter from Bernie Sanders, and uh, he was responding directly to me uh, about an inquiry that uh, I made uh, on behalf of the Alliance over the last couple days. And also another one is from Senator Leahy, uh, and uh, that was also a response that came through uh, John Tracy, uh, no relation to Max Tracy, by the way. Okay. Um, so um, after that, after I read these, what I'm going to do is just to set your expectations and set others' expectations. Is is I'm, I'm going to look to Celine Coburn to come uh, after this. Um, is she still here? She did she get bored with us? Oh, there, there she. <laughs> Representative Coburn is here in the house. She's got something to say. So uh, don't go anywhere. She's got something to say up in here. Somebody say up in here. Y'all learning. Up in here. That's what's happening. Now check this out. This says, thank you, uh, dear Mark. Uh, thank you for um, contacting me in support of eliminating the filibuster. I have said before that I appreciate how Senate rules set the difference between the House of Representatives and the Senate. However, given the enormity of the issues we must tackle, I believe now is the time to re-examine some of those rules. I agree with you that we must end the filibuster that currently exists as soon as we can. Let me begin by saying that the filibuster, which most often takes the form of excessive amendments or long speeches, is a broad term used to refer to any action taken with the intention of blocking a vote. That doesn't sound very good, does it? However, there is an option in filibuster called cloture. Under the cloture rule, the Senate can limit or in debate on a bill, but only by a vote of three-fifths of the full Senate, normally 60 votes. In my view, I do not see getting significant support from members of the minority party in the foreseeable future. 
If raising the minimum wage, expanding the Voting Rights Act, and taking action on many issues facing our country requires us to change Senate procedure, then that is what we must do. Given the enormous crisis facing working families today, we cannot allow a minority of the Senate to obstruct what the vast majority of the American people want and need. Please know that I will keep your message in mind as I continue pushing for bold, progressive action. Thank you for contacting me, and please feel free to stay in touch about this and any other subject of interest to you for up-to-date information, blah, 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 blah. Bernie Sanders, United States Senator. There is, I don't have enough hands, so just bear with me for a minute here. There, I also have a brief statement from Patrick Leahy. Uh, and uh, again, this was um, communicated to me from, uh, from uh, John Tracy. Uh, and it's quoted and he reiterated because I, um, because I made sure that I, I went back to him just clarifying, ensuring that these are in fact the Senator's words. He said they are. He said, uh, this is what the Senator says, quote, it is important to remember that both parties have used the filibuster to stop legislation they oppose. In recent years, Democrats have used the filibuster to prevent harmful policies from being enacted. That being said, we can't let the filibuster be used as a tool for complete obstruction. It is supposed to encourage bipartisan compromise, not entrench partisan wealth warfare. The Senate must be a body that debates. The Republican Party is blocking debate on critical initiatives, including proposals to protect the right to vote. I think we need to consider all options in order to push forward the American people's priorities that may involve reforming the filibuster. Yeah. Patrick Leahy, United States Senator. So I just wanted to make sure that you had the most up-to-date communication that we are getting from the senators. Why are we here? Why are we here? Uh, Celine's on standby, but why are we here? I'm using my third hand again. One of the things that's important to remember is, is that there's a big lie that's going on right now that's creating voter suppression and fa a false narrative of this whole critical race theory and threatening our, the democracy of this, this nation. Would you agree? Yeah. Number two, at least 61 bills with restrictive voting provisions in 18 states are moving through legislators and 31 of them are already halfway through. Would you agree? Yeah. The only hope that we have to address voter suppression and to roll back all of these laws is getting rid of the filibuster. There is no, there is no, there, there is no reconciliation. There is no, there, there is no bipartisan effort that's going to enable us to get after. Yes, we do understand that. Yeah, by the way, the Department of Justice finally woke up over the last couple of days. But still, there is, there is no hope on this side of the galaxy that we're going to get all of these laws rolled back that are depriving our folks of their vote. And where that's taking us is on a trajectory to midterm election, where the House and the Senate flips. Now, do you think the Republicans are going to be sitting around talking about the filibuster, whether they're going to get rid of it or not, when the choice is in their hands? No. The only hope we have right now on gun control, immigration, climate, is to kill the filibuster. The filibuster is a rule that's racist, it's a Jim Crow relic, it's far overdue for permanent eradication. Dr. King in 1963 said the exactly same thing. I was born in 1963. We've been waiting far too long for this to happen. Midterms, 2024, all of this hanging in the balance. Now, just to be clear, this is not just about race. This is not even just, this is not even partism. This is about the future of our democracy. This is about the soul of this nation. Somebody need to say, bust filibuster. Bust filibuster. We want justice. What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? 
When do we want it? Now. When do we want it? Now. When do we want it? Now. We want it now. Stand by. Celine Coburn's got something to say. She's on her way. Come on up, Celine. Representative Coburn's jogging up to the stage. She's got a bag full of notes with her. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everybody, and yeah. thanks to uh, Racial Justice Alliance, Rights and Democracy, Vermont Progressive Party, and others for organizing this event and bringing us together. I'm Selena Colburn. I'm a representative in the Vermont House, representing Burlington's Chittenden 6-4 district, which is just up the hill a little way, and I'm the leader of the House Progressive Caucus, where I'm really lucky to work with Representative Bihovsky, who you heard from earlier. And uh, I am really happy and grateful to be here with all of you. And yes, we absolutely need to abolish the filibuster so we can make meaningful progress on racial justice, on climate action, on income inequality, and on criminal justice reform, and a whole host of other issues. But there is one critical issue that underpins all of the, these that will have disastrous impacts if the filibuster stays intact. And that is the very survival of our democracy, as flawed and aspirational as it is. And that is because state legislators, legislatures across the country are bringing concerted efforts to roll back voting rights and power of the people. One of the issues that led me to work in politics was reproductive justice. I was active in the reproductive justice movement before I became elected and did that kind of work. And there is a reason that so many state legislatures are able to pass draconian restrictive laws limiting access to reproductive health care, even as the majority of residents support access and choice in these matters. And it's because of gerrymandering, which has created districts that allow outsized power to conservative lawmakers, white supremacist lawmakers. And we are going to see so much more of this in the coming year as legislator, legislatures across the country are required to react to the 2020 census data and draw new lines for voting districts. And I just want to be really, really clear that yes, we have passed some great voting laws in Vermont, unlike many states in the rest of the country, but we are not immune to this issue here. The redistricting process in Vermont is going to be largely controlled by moderate Democrats and Republicans. And if we want to ensure that progressives and progressive Democrats remain in power and have a voice and are able to be a voice of the people, we are going to be in, need to be involved and watch this process closely in Vermont. We also need federal protections against gerrymandering and against the racist laws that are designed plain and simple to prevent BIPOC folks, to prevent folks living in poverty or with disabilities from having equal access to the voting booth. Yeah. As Mark said, almost 400 bills have been introduced this past year. Over 60 have seen movement in state legislatures, 28 laws have already been enacted restricting access to the voting booth, and many legislatures are still meeting, still debating, and still moving more of these laws. The laws contain provisions such as limiting the ability to vote by mail, making in-person voting more difficult with harsh identification requirements, voter roll purges, limited polling place availability, and you can guess where that where polling place ability remains and where it is taken away. These provisions are designed to silence the voices of BIPOC Americans, first and foremost. 
Republicans know they cannot win on the merits of their policies or arguments anymore, and they can only hold on to power by limiting people's access to the vote. We need the kind of federal protections in S-1, the For the People Act. These include campaign finance reforms, such as the elimination of secret corporate money yes. into candidates, an expansion of protections for voting access, more democratic registration processes, guaranteed early voting periods, and most importantly, I think, putting independent commissions rather than elected officials in charge of redistricting efforts. Yeah. This is the fight that underpins everything we want to achieve in the political process as a progressive movement for equal rights, for racial justice, for criminal justice reform, for a healthy planet, and so much more. So please, please join me in speaking out, calling on our Vermont senators to do the same, talking to your friends and neighbors about this issue, and let us end once and for all the white supremacist power grab that this filibuster is empowering. Thank you. Damn, bro. Wow, give it up for Representative Celine Carver. Selena Culver, Selena Culver. Selena, you've been in there for what? What, about four? Is this your fourth, fifth term? Your fifth term. Fifth year. I was going to say fifth. Oh, you wasn't old enough to be in there five terms ago. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I want to I wanna just spend a little bit of time uh, with you uh, before we uh, bring up um, Sister Zariah Hightower who's uh, snuck, snuck up on us, she's, she's right here with us, um, our, our very own. But I, I just want to get you to think about a couple of things here real quick. Because many people here, I know, because I know I'm one of them, we're sitting around, we're like, yeah, we're good to go, you know, we're, we're in Vermont, we're all set, you know, we got this 80% vaccination thing going on, everything's good to go, you know, we've got, you know, we've got, I mean, our, our governor's Republican, but he's like the coolest Republican I know, so, I mean, I, you know, so guys are like, yeah, I voted for him, and yeah, we all get along here, you know, and, and everything's fine, and we, you know, we've got our, we've got a majority in our house, Democrats in our Senate as well. Everything's hunky dory. We're the first state to abolish slavery. I uh, know. Um, we'll come back to that. But but the thing is, is that you know this little state right here. We are a part of the United States of America. Okay, is one of the things that we have to remember. One of the things I don't care how comfortable you get. At the end of the day, how many people felt it when our president of the United States was Trump? That's because we are a part of the United States of America. And when these policies are passed, uh, when we have voter voting registration, uh, voting privileges being stolen from our brothers and sisters in the South and across the Midwest, that tips the balance of power. And at the end of the day, the federal policy, we feel at the end of the day, it impacts us. You know, we are not a different country. But now let me just flip that on his head for a minute. Uh, as Zariah gets ready to come, is, is that here's the other thing. Uh, even though we're a small state, we are a state. And because we are a state, we have power as a state. But here's the thing, and I told you about it a little while ago. We've got two of the most powerful senators in the United States, in the United States Senate. We've got, think about that. Think about that. With their voices, if Bernie and Patrick get together and say anything, I'd like to see somebody say that it's not a done deal. And at least try me. Give it a shot and let us see what happens. But what I've seen up until now with this filibuster thing is, is they have not stood together on this. They have not communicated together on this in uniform saying we collectively, as a state of Vermont, as a delegation, we vehemently oppose this racist Jim Crow rule. They have not done it. We need to call them into accountability and call them into accountability to do so. Further, we need to tell them to tell Chuck Schumer and all of the rest of the game it, to, to stay in D.C. Stay in D.C. until you get this figured out. 
We don't need you back in Vermont. They don't need you in other places across the state. We don't need a delegation from the Rules Committee in Georgia. What we need is, is we need all of our senators under the dome in D.C. working this thing out and coming to a decision on what they're going to do about the filibuster. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we need. So, so enough about telling me about coming home from Independence Day because we are headed towards a new Jim Crow. So I think I got that off my chest. Let me introduce somebody to you. Uh, I am so pl proud and pleased to introduce uh, not just a, a, one of our own city council uh, members, but the, only, the, the first and only black woman in our city council, also a good friend, a person who have a deep respect for, uh, and just give it up for my good friend, Zariah Hightower! Yeah. Hey, y'all. Um, I don't really know. Mark said I had between one and two minutes, which is not a lot of time. And now he's telling me five, so I'm apparently supposed to make up the other three and a half, eight and a half, something like that minutes. Um, I moved to Vermont a, over five years ago now, and a lot of you don't know, but I came from Oklahoma. And in Oklahoma, there is one county that is purple. <laughs> and the rest are red. So that was the context that I came from. And the worst curse that um, Vermont gave me was to learn more about the Democratic Party and not just to take the Democratic Party for a given, um, which was a hard lesson for me to learn. And I, I feel like the more that I learn about how our government works, I used to think it was just a numbers game. We just have to get enough numbers in the House. We just have to get enough numbers in the Senate. We just have to get enough numbers to win the presidency, and it would be fine. And we're, I mean, we're not all the way there yet, but we're pretty damn close, and yet here we are, and we're, we're not fine. We're not even a little bit fine. And I think that is upsetting, because at least as a politician, I feel like I'm starting to get a little bit of an inside scoop, and um, I feel like the problem with our parties is that ultimately a lot of the people in the House, not all of them, but most of the people in the House and most of the people in the Senate, they still see more in common with the people across the aisle than they see with you or with me. They look at each other and they say, these rules have worked for us. We know the rules. The rules are putting us in power. We're going to stick to these rules. And the rules don't work for us. <laughs> But that doesn't matter because they're like, oh, it would be uncomfortable for me. It would have to be a new regime, a new something else. And I think that's where the filibuster is and where so many other policies are is, well, I don't really want to give this up because I know how to find success in this regime. And that sucks because it doesn't work for most of us. It doesn't work for the 99%. It doesn't work for those of us who aren't at those houses, those of us who aren't in Washington, D.C. And therefore, I just feel like that is the new expectation that we have to have, is going to all of the parties, not just the Republican, not just the, and, but also the Democrats, and saying, stop looking at the Republicans and seeing yourselves in them and saying, oh, I identify with that. Oh, maybe at some point I'll be in that situation again. Oh, actually, I kind of understand why you would. No, <laughs> identify with us. We're the ones who voted you into power. We're the ones that it's not working for. Change, change the fucking rules. <laughs> the rules are made to work for us and they're not working. That is all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Zariah. Zariah Hightower, city councilor, for first black woman. That's what's up. And there's gonna be some more. Black women, raise your hands. Black women. I see some sisters back there. You gonna run for city council? Yeah, I see you back there, sister. All right, we got Rodney Edens coming back at you. We just got, got another piece. He's, he's uh, looking through the book right now, and I know he's got something for us. Rodney, can you come with a spoken word for us? Uh, on deck, we've got Pastor, um, Pastor the Reverend Dr. Pastor Christopher Von Cockrell, my pastor, uh, sitting right over here. I'm going to be over chat with him. I'm not going to be rude, but... Uh, right now we've got Rodney Evans coming back! 
Thank you. I want to share a piece with you uh, in honor and in the spirit of recognizing all of our humanity and honoring that we're not truly free to all of us are free. All of us have access, all of us have opportunity and resources. And so thankful to see all of you here for that purpose. This is called Why We Still Need Black History Month. Don't be so fearful of being racist that it deludes your common sense. Are so fearful of racism existing, you become a hypocrite. I wrote this on the off chance there would be some black people who love themselves enough to listen in the audience. Are some white people who know black folk exist in more than convenient moments. Are just some human folk who love truth and have enough sense to care about their roots. The librarian asked me, why do you think we still need Black History Month? For the same reason that Texas calls slavery unpaid internship. Because the evil of ignorance and racism must be vigilantly opposed with truth, love, and sincere inclusion. Because it was once Negro History Week and for the children who daily see themselves through the lens of stereotypes and those who only know television as relationship to black people and people of color. For my daughters who are growing and will not be choked out by the diminishing of our value. For the legacy of our people that makes American ideals a sought for reality rather than a cliche banality. For you, for your spirit and your conscience so it doesn't putrefy in the delusion of denial and fear-made religion. Because black people must not become history. Our story is a part of your story. The beauty, wonder, triumphs, and trials need to be known. Sung from the hilltops and mountain peaks, resounding in the valleys and grass plains, echoing down the alleyways and boulevards. Because black, red, brown, yellow are the colors of my true love's hair and the universe because beauty and truth will not be contained, because these are our ancestors. We owe them a debt of gratitude, because love will not be silenced, because teaching white supremacy is poison. We are all still recovering, conditioned to tolerate it in small doses. The human family must heal. Soon this sickness will be vomited, and all that will remain will be you, beautiful, healthy, free-minded Jew. Think of it as your chance to celebrate the human family in preparation for making every day our celebration. Got the edit! Come on, if that was for me, I'd be okay, but give it up for Rajni, okay? Amen. Yeah! That's what I'm talking about. And now I just want to um, just uh, turn in for a moment and uh, just focus a little bit um, more on from a perspective uh, from, uh, from the man of God. Um, I specifically invited my pastor here because I was interested to hear his thoughts on the whole matter. So this is, this is unrehearsed. So here we go, pastor. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. When I was a little boy in Mississippi, I had a history teacher that shared these words with me. We hold these truths to be evident that all men are created equal. Boy, was that some bull crap. We all know that all men are not created equal. And it's not always just a race thing. It's also an economic thing. And when you have those who are rich, those who are privileged, take advantage of those who are less fortunate, those who are 
LGBTQ T or Latino or come from anywhere south of Texas or anyone whose skin tone is a little darker than a tan. When you see these people and don't respect them, we have a problem. So we as communities, we, 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 we have our little local elections and we send these individuals to Washington to represent us, all of us. But we find them not always representing us. They represent now parties that we're not invited to. They represent parties of exclusion. They represent parties that, that, that want to make the rich richer and relocate the poor to poor areas. Gentrification is real, folks. And, and what happens is I get in the office and to ensure that I stay in office, I talk to people that like me and those that don't like me, I draw them out the map. And so now I have a map of, of around people that don't like me, that I don't represent. And then I move into their neighborhoods and I take their neighborhoods and I say, we'll put up affordable housing, but only 25 of them can move back in. Next week, in 2003, a man went to work where my brother worked, pulled out his shotgun, and killed several people, murdered them. And since 2003, at that time, that was the largest workplace murder in the country. Sad to say, the numbers have increased. And they say we don't need gun control. There's this thing also in this thing called the Constitution that says, talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Until you've had a loved one murdered. Until you've had someone snuffed out by gun violence, then you'll realize that there really needs to be some conversation. There needs to be something said. And debate the subject. Talk about it. Argue about it. Present your facts. And after presenting your facts, if you can show me where, my brother had the right to die and not have the pursuit of happiness. I'll agree with you. But you know, like I know, that's a bald-faced lie. We're dealing with situations. These are real-life situations. And people are suffering. People are hurting. Allow them to carry on the argument. If you have a good argument, then present it. Don't kill it. Don't stop it. Don't present it. But whatever you do, write your congressman, call your congressman. We've got two of the most powerful men in this nation that need to stand up. Just like he stood up with fair wages, he needs to stand up and talk about doing away with this filibuster. We need to be able to carry on intelligent, informative conversations that are not formed in back rooms, but on Senate floors. Thank you very much. We thank you for being with us today, and we pray that God will continue to bless each and every one of you. Thank you, Pastor Von Cockrell.
Uh, we've got one other speaker tonight, but before we get on to that, I just want to um, just give you a moment, give you an opportunity to do something. Because by now you're probably sitting there, you're going, wow, it's a pretty compelling case. Um, so what do I do? So what we have on the table there is, it's not just shirts, but there's some QR codes over there. <clears throat> and there is one particular QR code that's right in the center of that page. Can you hold that up? As a matter of fact, why don't you just go out there? Some, some, some of y'all, grab a clipboard, but just go out there. Po since folks won't come to you, go to them. And y'all get your, get your smartphone out. I know you got one. Get your smartphone out, scan that center. There are, there are multiple codes on that, on that uh, sheet. If you want to get on our list, there's a code you can scan. If you want to offer a donation, there's a code you can scan. If you want to hear more about turn, uh, um, the, the, the turning the curve on systemic racism, building back a healthier Vermont, there's a code you can scan. Oh, we even have one on there that is about um, the um, Abolish slavery, which is going to be one of the events that we're going to be having really soon because we want you to know that PR2, uh, I think Representative uh, Selena Coleman remembers PR2, but PR2 is a constitutional amendment where we're ensuring that we have language in our constitution that says slavery and indentured servitude are prohibited under all circumstances. Why? Because there are two loopholes that currently exist. And all you have to do is read for about 30 seconds into your constitution and you'll see that yourself. So you can scan and you can get additional information about that and more. Uh, so, so for all of you guys where, who, have, um, who have come, I uh, want to thank you. But before we go, I do want to give you the opportunity uh, to um, scan, your, scan these QR codes, get some information. What you're going to come up with is, is when you scan this one that's in the center of the page, what you're going to find is it's going to take you to a place where all you gotta do is fill in this form, and when you fill the form in, it'll take you over to a form letter that automatically goes to the, both of the senators, okay? So, so this is your opportunity to do something. For those of you who've come here and haven't done anything yet, this is your opportunity. Scan the code, fill out the brief form, it's just asking you for your name, your, your email address, and so forth. Uh, fill that out on your phone, hit press, Bernie and Senator Leahy will each get an email and they will know that you are serious about this. Further, what you can do is when you receive communication on that on your back email, that'll give you the opportunity also to pass that on to each one teach one, so pass it along and let other folks know about it. So now, um, I think our, our last, before we go to our last uh, speaker, I just want to uh, encourage you, encourage you tonight um, we, are, we are going to, uh, we're going to stay after this, we're going to stay after this, so if you're not on our mailing list, get on our mailing list. I'm going to come back and close this out right at the end, but we have one final speaker, and that is a gentleman by the name of Reverend Arnold Thomas. He is here with us from his uh, Good Shepherd Church there, uh, nestled in the hills, nestled in the hills of Good Jericho. This is my brother. He is also uh, a, um, a member of the steering committee of the Racial Justice Alliance. This brother has been on the beat uh, for many, many years here in Vermont. Our own, my friend, Reverend Arnold Thomas. So we're out to bust the filibuster. Let's say it aloud. Bust, bust the, the filibuster. filibuster. And you know, when we bust the filibuster, we're not only busting the filibuster, we're busting a nightmare. A nightmare that has haunted us since and even before the inception of this nation. A nightmare that continues to rob black and brown and LGBTQ and non-binary Americans of their full privilege and rights to participate in the fullness of their citizenship in this country. We are not only busting the filibuster, we are busting a nightmare and allowing a long-awaited dream to come true. So when you say that you're going to bust the filibuster, be careful 
of what you wish for. Because in truth, in reality, we need to realize that the Civil War never really came to an end. The Civil War continues. When we look at the states in this nation that are enacting voter suppression laws, you will realize that those states number far more than the states that seceded from the Union in the Civil War. The Civil War has not ended. It has only taken on a new face. It has moved from Civil War to Jim Crow, and the Jim Crow continues to this day. When, when the Declaration of Independence said that all men are created equal, we know what they were really talking about. They weren't even talking about all white men. They certainly weren't even talking about all white women. They were talking about a few privileged white males with property. Amen. And many who hold the purse strings of many of the conservative right-wing pro-Trump followers want to hold on to that privilege and deny a growing majority of people of color from assuming the privilege that they want to protect. So when we say bust the filibuster, we are putting forth a scenario, a scenario that could promote and aggravate not only insurrection, but even possibly another civil war. Let me put it plainly. And as I say this, I want you to know that I'm hoping and praying that this does not come true. We should continue to hope and pray that this scenario does not realize itself, but we need to also prepare ourselves for the real possibility that it will. One of the main reasons you have this resistance to busting the filibuster is that if the filibuster were destroyed, and if the federal government enact, uh, enacted a for the people law that allowed more equitable, fair voting rights for all, then you would place a situation, a scenario that, that allowed federal law to come up against state law. State law. State rights versus federal rights. Now, when Wallace, George Wallace, stood in front of the University of Alabama to prevent black people from integrating that university, Kennedy federalized the state National Guard, confronted George Wallace and said, get out or consider yourself a traitor. And Wallace made a few comments and stepped aside. The same scenario has the real possibility of presenting itself again. The states that are in the process or have already enacted voter suppression laws, if the For the People Act is passed, will be confronting a federal law in which Biden or whoever the president is has the power to federalize the, na the state National Guard and confront the governors and the legislation of each of those states and say, what side are you on? Are you going to be a, a pro-Trump supporter or are you going to be an American citizen? And if you're going to be a pro-Trump supporter, ladies and gentlemen, people of all walks of life, Vermonters here today, 
if you're going to be a pro-Trump supporter, you have the makings of another civil war in which the federal and state governments are at war with each other. Now I'm praying, now I'm praying that this does not happen because many of those states that have enacted or in the process of enacting these voter suppression laws have a growing number of, of populations of color that I think will prevent that from overflowing into a civil war. Texas already has more people of color than whites. California has more people of color than whites. Hawaii definitely has more people of color than whites. And that trend is flowing throughout the South and will gradually work itself north so that by the time 2045 comes around, we will be a predominantly people of color nation. Now a small minority of people in power do not want that to happen. And they are pulling out all their guns, all their strongest ammunition to prevent that from happening. But the inevitability is going to happen. The inevitability is that this nation will truly evolve into a nation where all people will have the right to exercise their citizenship as Americans. And we need to be prepared to stand up and to travel that road regardless of the resistance that we will face. I represent, and Reverend Cockrell represents, faith communities that talk about bringing the realm of God into the real world. And that realm of God does not favor any one faith tradition. It doesn't favor any partisan or, or uh, sect. It is a realm of God in which all people, all people, must participate. And all people must take an active role in making that dream a reality. But in making our dream a reality, we have to bust the filibuster. We have to bust this nightmare that we have lived with since the inception and before the inception of this nation. And by busting that filibuster, our dream will finally come true. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Arnold Thomas. <laughs> we love you. That is a brother. We are coming to a close. Uh, we made a commitment. We said we were going to start at 4 and we're going to end at 5.30. Uh, we're closing down on, on 5.30 right now. I do want to just offer some thank yous uh, to a few folks. Uh, of course, I want to offer thanks uh, for everyone who came and was able to speak. Uh, please uh, reach back out to me so we can um, circle back around with you and, and make sure that we recognize you uh, in other ways. Uh, uh, special shout out to Rajni Eddins, a great friend and just wonderful poet. Poet, Please give it up for Rajni one more time, please. Yeah. Pastor, I love you. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'm, always, I'm always glad to have you near me. You can't go wrong when the man of God is near you, okay? So I just want to give a special shout out, you know, also, uh, Zariah, thank you so much, where are you? Hugging, hugging Tanya over there, dancing already, yeah, I got some music for you too. Um, where is Selena? Selena's still here. Stayed around to the end, God bless you. Uh, and just, uh, yeah, Roy V. Hill, uh, Roy V. Hill, <laughs> Roy, and Roy V. Hill, <laughs> I love you, my brother. Uh, who did I miss? Um, uh, and me, me, of course, me. I'm, I'm here. Uh, and um, so I, I just want to encourage. I want to encourage you all, though, because this is not hopeless. I, I think when I, I woke up uh, on vacation a few days ago and I said we should just do this, uh, it was because it was out of hopelessness 
uh, out of frustration, uh, just out of confusion, and honestly fear that I decided that we would, that we would do something like this. In fact, um, I think I could say the same story about Justice For All when we started that organization in 2014 in the wake of Michael Brown. Uh, so sometimes what we have to do, Saints, is, is that it's important uh, that what we do is, is, yeah, we process that which we're seeing, that we're experiencing. We take it, we, we, we take it in. We, we recognize the fact that we're dealing, with, we're dealing with fear, we're dealing with uncertainty, we're dealing with just what feels like hopelessness, but one thing I can, I can guarantee you your failure in is if you do nothing. Uh, the only exception is it could be if it's regarding systemic racism and you are white, because you will benefit. However, uh, the, the thing is, when, when we're talking about something like this, um, this, this, is, this is something that we can do. It makes sense that we turn to these senators. It makes sense that we turn to them because they are in position, watch this, we put them in position. We put them in position to handle this matter, okay? We elected Bernie Sanders and Patrick Leahy, right? and, and it is okay for us to tell them to do their job, and it is not unreasonable it is not unreasonable for us to expect that in a dire situation like this, when we see that voting rights are being thrown out the window across the nation, jeopardizing the democracy of this nation and placing in peril every single one of us, it is a reasonable expectation that we ask them to speak out publicly on this matter, that they hold one another accountable and that they hold their, their colleagues accountable on this matter. That, that there, yes, I do agree, there should be a debate. This is the matter upon which a debate should be occurring. Bust the filibuster. So what you can do as you go home, whether you scan that code or not, you can pick the phone up, you can, you can talk to your neighbors, you can tell them to pick the phone up. You can go and take a, you, you can call your representative. You can, they're, they're in, both of them are in, the, all three of them are in the state right now. You can reach out to them. You can ask them why they're not doing this. You can reach out to other elected officials and ask them to put pressure on them as well. Because collectively, we win. Here's the, here, this right here is honestly, this is the secret. The secret is, is that there's only one 1%. There's only one 1% and this particular racist rule that's being used is being used to take our voices from us so that our will, so, so, so that the, the policies that we want most, like clean water, policies that we want most like, like decent immigration, like reasonable gun control laws, those kinds of policies. So if they, if they take our voices from us nationally, if they take our voices from us, then those policies they don't have to consider. They don't have to take, they don't have to take into account what the majority actually wants. That's what they're trying to do. Have a nice day, sir. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's up to you. The power is in your hands. Still, just like it was from the beginning, this is a country of the people, for the people, and by the people. The power is in your hands. So again, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Special shout out to Rights and Democracy. Give it up. And also want to, uh, I think Black Perspective was here. I'm not sure if they're, they are here, but Black I do just give them a shout out anyway. Give them a shout out. Uh, uh, give it up for my team over here at Racial Justice Alliance for figuring out how to put that tent up. They figured out how to get that tent up. It was crazy. It was ridiculous. Uh, getting that tent up. And uh, yeah, I just want to wish you all a good evening. Thank you all for coming out. That is it. I think that's a wrap. Make sure you stop by, uh, stop by Rights of Democracy. Get some, uh, get some additional information uh, on some of the things that they're doing. They got a bunch of stuff that's going on. I want to really lift those folks up and also want to lift the folks up at the Alliance. Stay tuned. We got a lot of stuff coming at you, okay? Good night, y'all. Yeah.